It's a beautiful Friday here from from the Brushwood Studios. Oh wow! Never saw that view before. <laughs> We're packed today. Uh, yeah. This is normally Justin's camera, but we zoomed it out today. You just took away a little bit of the magic. I'm not gonna lie. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, everybody. We're gonna do the uh, program here in a little bit. Just a moment. How are you doing, Andrew? I'm doing fantastic, um, objectively speaking. Oh, really? That is like my stupid thing I say, and I can't stop myself before I do it, because I'll be like, I'm doing fantastic. And I used to say, I'm doing fantastic. And now I do, objectively speaking, and it's just automatic. And I feel like an idiot every time I do that. And I'm going to have to like just start punching myself. Because it's, it's, uh, it's a joke for yourself? Or because other people well, don't aren't in on it. I mean, the first time I said it, it may be funny, but if I said it to you like multiple times, mm. how funny would it be? Yeah, I could see that. It it would be a little. You, you would lose. You'd lose some of the edge. Yeah, like when not we to say that I had much when, edge to begin <laughs> with. So <laughs> I got plenty of edge. When we when we had the toilet frog a few weeks ago. For a couple of days, every time Brian would go into our the little restroom we have here in the studio, he would always like exclaim like he just found a frog. Yeah. Um, and it, it only took one or two of those times for me to be like, okay, eh, you're never gonna see that frog again. It's it's as you get older and you become aware of your patterns, and if your environment doesn't change much, your patterns just become you know. The conversations with your parents tend to be the same conversation you've had in the last 10 years, you know? And and I know for myself, too, like, you know, being one of the older people in a company I work at that, like, I'm very quickly going to step into that territory of, like, oh, yeah, he's going to tell you this story. Oh, yeah, it's mm -hmm. this, it's that. So, yeah. Uh, all right. You want to do some weird things? Yes. Okay. Then I'll count you all in. All kinds of weird things. <laughs> I'll count you in, in three, two. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined with here, my good friend, my co-host. That's right. The only person that matters. The only co-host. Bryce Castillo. Hi. Thanks for having me, Andrew. I'm glad to, I'm glad to be back on the show. <laughs> I love that Bryce says thanks for having me. Bryce controls everything, the audio, <laughs> the microphones, the delivery, all of that. And we were talking about this before the show because we're missing two other people. They're not important. And and I'm like, well, we know who, like, they talk about, like, what a, I just watched Lake Placid, and they talk about what a keystone species is, and that's, like, the cornerstone of everything else there. And we know who the keystone species here on this <laughs> podcast is. It's not Justin. It's not Brian. It is not me. It is Bryce. Is that, that Bryce can keep this train rolling no matter what. We are relevant. So thank you for having me. I'm, uh, uh, you're, uh, well, I'm happy to have you. Uh, what are we going to talk about today? Thank sir? you. Man, I got this thing I've been thinking about. I figure uh, we we could talk about with with the other two on another time and be a different discussion. So I think it'll be evergreen. This is something I want you let's 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 go into the wild world of conjecture right now. Okay, mm -hmm. I work. I mean, there's my job with AI, but then there's every day I interact with ChatGPT. Like I am when I sit down at my computer. Using my computer now means for me having several chat GPT windows open as I do work. And, and it's, it's wow. research, whatever, a lot of code, a lot of these other stuff, playing with things, whatever. Open and I just unveiled this new thing now called chat preferences, which lets you basically tell chat GPT how to respond to you. So there's my work, which is like, oh, let me come up with some demos to showcase what this can do. But then there's just my life of like playing with this stuff nonstop. Like, um, and I get way more done now way more i can code things like while we were trying to get our show up and running literally within the time of that i was able to spin up a database in the background and a user interface and all that wow right? that was I mean, like just five ten minutes that was that was really quick wow the, the computers bryce the computers <laughs> okay well uh, it, it, it's and it because it comes like i know i know like oh and i know it knows python i know what it can create a flash server or whatever blah blah so anyhow point is is like I can see this. We're seeing this now. There have been like Microsoft unveiled, unveiled Copilot 365, which is going across their entire suite of Microsoft products. 
Google is doing stuff. We've been adding plugins and function stuff, and it's going to start creeping into all kinds of other places. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm not here to talk about AI though. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying to talk about is the acceleration. Forget whatever the singularity may mean, and even forget like what it means to have AGI or the new hot term is ASI, artificial superintelligence. Oh, just I don't like that. That's that seems a uh, <laughs> market testing it. We're market testing it. But the point is, is that, but you do need to categorize to say like, because there's a difference between something that's like capable as human capable. And there's things that can exceed us hmm. and systems now can exceed us in several ways. Several ways they're way behind us. And, and, and I can, I can, I can speak for hours about the current limitations of LLMs and whatnot. But point being, we are in a place we did not foresee six months ago, the, the widespread use of these systems six, seven months ago, the idea that, that LLMs, large language models, were going to be this widespread, that this many people would be doing this, that you would hear people, their jobs are being impacted. Copywriters and other people talk about, hey, this is affecting me, and it's going to affect other jobs. It's going to create opportunities. It's going to disrupt stuff. But the point is, there's an acceleration happening, right? Mm -hmm. And we can think that, that, and it's going to apply to other things. If you are a biologist, a year from now, two years from now, whatever, you're going to probably, if you're going to want to be competitive and do really good research, you are going to be using a tool that is going to help you accelerate it. And you're going to say, hey, I need to look at these samples, spin up a database and write some things on this, write some tests, whatever. Boom. And I can see what I see internally in computing. And the thing I'll mention is like, OpenAI is a tiny company. It's a very tiny company. I mean, there is, you know, it is very compared to everybody else. And we are able to have a big impact in part because we use a lot of our tools and our systems to do this sort of stuff. Like we, we, we play with this, but that's going to extend elsewhere and you're going to see that elsewhere. So what happens when all of a sudden a biologist can spin up a version of chat GPT or, you know, Copilot, Bard, uh, Claude, or whatever system there's going to be out there. There's many other people now in this space. What happens when they can spin this thing up and it helps accelerate their work or an engineer or something, there's always going to be limitations in the, in the physical, you know, Adam's part of the world, but I think we're going to see an acceleration in a lot of places and a lot of areas. And we have things, I'm getting to a point, I swear, I swear I'm getting to my <laughs> point. We have, we're seeing things like now fusion research, energy, like fusion energy research, improved reactor designs. If I'm going to get there, trust me, if 10 years from now, imagine 10 years from now, I don't even have to say ASI or AGI, just systems that are 10x better than what we have now. Like, I can't imagine what a 10x GPT-4 would be like because it, it's, it's, it's already incredibly capable. I mean, I know how it would improve it. But anyhow, imagine we have abundant intelligence systems, we have abundant energy, and we can solve a lot of problems. We can move capital to solve things, do things like this. When I'm getting that price, is it time to start thinking about creating Starfleet? Creating Starf. Oh, oh. Uh, uh, now, uh, pretend I pretend I was uh, dummy about that particular franchise. What would what would be the top level on Starfleet? Galactic so communism. Starfleet, well, I mean, they they, they uh, it's socialist. <laughs> but let's 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 ignore you know one the ugly history of socialism and that aspect of it and yeah. the, the the hand waviness that. That aspect, that's the thing that always sort of got to me in Star Trek was like, ah, we don't have any need for money, you know, says Captain Picard. Like, don't you own a vineyard in France? <laughs> like, don't you own like a huge vineyard? Like, does everybody get a vineyard in your future? Do we all have vineyards like French, you know, chateaus and stuff? Is that a normal? Yeah. No, no, no. Oh, I hope so. Oh. But a starship captain gets to have that. <laughs> got it. He saved Sounds the day. Really? He saved the world. You know, the hero let the heroes drink, Andrew. Yeah, the hero of the Soviet Union, man. Uh, yeah, uh, that was the thing that, that that I will do a little side thing. That was like, like I, Star Trek is fun. I love Star Trek. Uh, new season of Strange New Worlds is fine. It's not very high stakes or exciting or whatever. And it's is sort of like the 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 you know, like the last episode I watched was one of these like. Hey, we're mining this giant gas field, and weird things are going wrong. And Uhura is hearing voices in her head. And you're like, okay, yeah, plot number twenty-two. You know, this is the same thing as the mining thing. Like, it's like, yes, we know this formula. This is the, the something in the gas mine is alive. And, and it's 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 it was sort of like 
I have to, like, I look at the timestamp like three minutes in. I'm like, I have to wait for 45 more minutes <laughs> to get to the thing. You're going to make been, me find oh, no. out all of these obvious things. Yeah. Yeah. If you've been watching, I love my camera zoom, by the way. It just did this wide zoom out. Uh, if I've been watching Star Trek ever, you would know. But anyhow, I, neither here nor there. I'm not going to talk about the political or the socioeconomic thing, but let's just say in an age of abundance and whatnot, an era when we have like tremendous amounts of money, whatever, and it could be, is it time for us to start thinking about building Starfleet? And I didn't think the Federation, more the Starfleet, the idea of like just expanding, outward expanding. Do, I mean, it, it, there not there an intermediate step where we do that on Earth, where we sprawl? the the less denser portions of the planet or like i guess that's the question is well, do, do we do we is there a bottle stopper that makes us overpopulate earth before we get to that point cuz there uh, i guess the, the, the data now doesn't look like we're overpopulation is not our biggest threat our data is going to be under underpopulation will be our biggest threat right oh. um uh, cuz just like it's just people even across the board you know like 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 China is going into a population decline. You know, there are very few countries are still continuing, but even then you can see there's the cycle. So underpopulation is the biggest threat to, to humanity, in my opinion, other than the potential of like, you know, battle poorly aligned AI. Yeah. Right. So, so then, but one, uh, uh-huh. no, go ahead. So, so are we exploring these strange new worlds? Are we, going embarking on what will probably be a kind of desolate mission to explore the universe or are we terraforming because it is we there's a good distance between us and other earth-like planets let's let's terraform let's assume that we're going to have abundant energy and that's one of the things is that it, this is a framework we look back and you look at what was the what was the engineering miracle of the day a hundred years ago, and now it's a commonplace thing. We do it all the time. You know, a, a suspension bridge was a huge deal, and now a suspension bridge, you know, those things open off. Okay, sure. tunneling through mountains and these things, and like we have the amount of you know, there's a great formula which is to look at like how much would you have to work to have an hour of reading light? Okay. You know, when Abraham Lincoln was born, it was like something like an hour, an hour. I forget that there was a ratio of how much time you would have to work to be able to afford the lamp oil to be able to have reading light. And these things were very scarce. And it's one of these things when when you watch movies that are set like historical pieces, one of the things that we really, really, really get wrong is how dark everything was. Because, you know, we, we, we light these things up like studio lighting, things like this, and maybe we'll have like a candle thing providing it. But you forget how dark it was because lighting was expensive. Like we live yeah. in this, like we're post singularity for lighting. Like literally we don't think about that. Like light is so abundant. So whatever, we don't care. And that's a magical thing that happened to the couple generations. Oh, you know, but yeah. extrap what's that? It, oh gosh. I bet there's a really interesting research paper in the rise of artificial lighting and like mega structure design, right? The, uh, the architecture of castles from when you needed, we, you were relying on the sunlight constantly to mm-hmm. skyscrapers today, to, to super dense packed cities um, where there is, it, you know, it, where you have a huge, uh, even, even a huge building office, right? Where you have mm-hmm. uh, completely locked off rooms, rooms that don't have windows and things. Um, and they aren't burning down because you're having to deal with the, uh, the flames on every floor. Um, I bet there's, there's something really interesting there about like that evolution of human design over centuries. Well, if you look at, if you look at the way we design stuff, like the reason we like skyscrapers is that a skyscraper allows you to have a maximum amount of people with natural light. Right. If you think about that, like, you know, you can, and you can't in a city. You can't really build. It's hard to build flat because just the land's too expensive. But skyscrapers actually maximize for that. You go into a Costco or you go to one of these big box stores, and you know you look up and you realize there's a lot of skylights in there. Now that lighting is primarily primarily artificial, but they do put the skylights in there partially too because if the lights go out, you won't have lights. But uh, yeah, our relationship with light is very interesting. But I'll just to get to the point though is that yeah. we can now afford 
like the the abundant amount of like I live in uh, a house that I run my AC all the time, and it's a it's a large house in Northern California. Is I got a solar panel out back, so during the day the solar panel is powering the AC, and, and my my electric bill is like two hundred bucks, right? Mm-hmm. And you can extrapolate that into the, you know if I doubled the number of solar panels or this or they got cheaper. Point is, if you imagine a world, if a, a world of so much energy, so much what your point about terraforming? Do we terraform? Maybe we terraform. Maybe we do that. Maybe you know Mars might be harder, but we could start building, you know big habitats but maybe maybe terraforming mars does become more doable on a 30 or 40 year time frame yeah maybe uh, you know what we would need is a breakthrough in in planetary climate control right we we would need something we would need a technology available that would presumably solve some amount of 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 ozone loss or 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 global warming potentially um as a as a an intermediary step between figuring out how exactly you nuke Mars to make it terraformed or what yeah, exactly I think, pa- bacteria I, yeah, I, you I, take yeah we 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 have solutions that are energy intensive now right but they become more practical carbon capture like carbon capture is a big thing the you know electrification whatnot you know it, it's sort of a, it's an interesting discussion because uh you know making car electric cars more efficient, whatever, reducing the amount of CO2, they, the supply chain and producing them produces. There's a lot of, a lot of, I think those are easy problems from a certain point of view. I'd be like, oh, how is it easy? It's like, what are easy problems for us today that were the most complex problems in the world a hundred years ago? You know, like there, there are things that we just, we forget how hard it was. We forget how hard things were. And, you know, now when you can be categorized as poor and have a car yeah. and have a phone. We have the idea when, of like the working poor, the working homeless. Like that's the yeah, level yeah. of technology that we have is that you are still not a, not an ideal state for somebody to remain in mind you, we're not, right. but we are, but that's the state like, of yeah, civilization. Like, like, uh, that's the state of technology. Yeah. Is, yeah. Yeah. You know, you talk to like uh, friends, like of grandparents that grew up in rural areas and people are still alive. Like, they had houses with dirt floors. You know, they had an outdoor outhouse, did not have plumbing. Like there was no plumbing and that was norm. There was one telephone at the neighbor's house. And these were people who were not, you know, they were poor by the standards in, but they still, a generation before they weren't, that was normal. And we, we just forget how much our standards have changed because we compare ourselves to what everybody else has. Mm-hmm. And let me tell you, you know, you buy a nice house, then you look at the other houses in the neighborhood and see what are bigger houses. And you start to go like, oh, yeah. You know, I wish I had that. And so that it's, it's, it never stops. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I don't know, I, I think about this in terms of how we teach history. I, I don't have a punchline on this yet, but like, uh, you know, as a child, you know, you they're spend... not here. It doesn't have to be funny. <laughs> so as, as a child, you spend 12 ish years, 16 ish years, 20 ish years. If you're a doctor or a lawyer learning, uh, being in the educational system along the way, learning and uh, learning a compressed version of history. Obviously, you can't go back and you, know, you have to you have to hit the highlights. But you you there there. I wonder if there's an effect of 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 learning and and intensifying uh, uh, a history and a, a history education. Um, and then being thrown out into the world. You know, we're talking about breakthroughs. We're talking about things that require scientific breakthroughs. And I think maybe emotionally it feels like those things can be so far away. But what we've seen with AI and large language models and all is that this stuff iterates very, very quickly. The time that we're, that we're talking about in this conversation is not necessarily uh, thousands of years. You know, we may be talking about tens of years, hundreds of hundreds of years, depending on the different issue. Like it, humanity does move pretty fast. It's just that we have to live one day at a time. I, yeah, it does. It, it, it feels slow. And then in retrospect, you sometimes realize how fast things happened. I, you know, we've had this talk about like artificial general intelligence, right? And a year ago, the timelines for AGI, when we'd reached that, a lot of it was like 50 years or whatever, were really further out. The timeline now in the last eight months is compressed considerably, not just by eight months, 
dramatically where people are talking a decade or less. There, there are, and there's some people say, oh, there's intermodal things we may never, and that might be, there might be some deal breakers out there. I don't know what they are. I, I've seen enough progression in every sort of dimension and understand enough about how you can solve for problems that seem harder to solve. And because some of the stuff you hear like, ah, it still can't do blank. It's like, yeah, that's a tokenization thing. And I can combine a thing with it's just some of these things I go like, no, that's actually we can fix these not, problems. These are problems. Yeah, like, like we want yeah, to there, solve there problems. Are, yeah. Yeah, we've seen the pathway to solve that. It's not a fundamental thing. But anyhow, um yeah, I think that we're we're now, you know. You can sit down and talk to GPT-4 and have an intelligent discussion with an AI. And that was something that a year ago really wasn't, was it really, you know, you could do the GPT-3 or whatever and go back and forth. But the way that works now, to GPT-4 to have a really complex discussion and forget that you were talking to an AI is very easy. So uh, so, so to bring it back to the, to the brief here, let's say that we do this, that we're we're Starfleet. We have. We're Earth we've, we've got fusion. We've got abundant energy. We've got abundant manufacturing systems. We've got all of the you know we, we've travel, got some pretty good forming. Yeah, we have. Uh, they're on the table. Like we can use like like just using conventional solutions right now. Like we don't have a there's there is not a there's not a realistic way to do fast and light travel right now. Sure. Um, but just check my. There's not a realistic way to do fast light travel right now, but there are ways to do uh, ex- near speed of light travel. We, we've talked about this before in the show. If you have enough energy, you can put use beam propulsion and you can propel systems using just light energy it, to accelerate them close to the, you can go, you can go relativistic speeds. You can get 70% the speed of light. Um, you just have to have a way to slow down on the other end. <laughs> yeah. That little but you can eventually build things up. So let's say, let's say that like if we wanted to, you know, Alpha Centauri, let's say we wanted to go colonize Alpha Centauri. Sure. Okay. What we do is we build a big, huge beam propulsion array that can propel things. So let's say 50% the speed of light. Okay. Now the, the, the challenge is, is that like, how do you slow it down when it gets there? Because that's the big thing about space is slowing down. You might do systems where, uh, you know, you basically, Send something towards there that's like a you know uh, creates a, a magnetic cloud or something to slow you down. There there are ways you can schemes and engineering solutions you can kind of figure out. But like once I can have a thing on the other end can slow me down, yeah. then maybe I can do it. And one of the things you can do is figure out like oh can I like shoot my beam propulsion system towards there and then have it shoot back. And sure. there are schemes, but eventually I, once you build your thing, it- I I could imagine. E- I, I I wonder if the solution looks like uh, instead of sending instead of sending the first one out that needs to be slowed down, just don't slow it down. Design something that's meant to crash into it to create I don't know create like a a bean bag sort of uh, uh, landing yeah, I mean, spot. They're- like there there are probably like really interesting lateral thoughts like that. That will that will break through. Right? Yeah, there 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 are things where you might you might aim it and try to put something with a trajectory that gets so close to the sun that you get it might it won't get gravitational capture because it would still probably be going too fast, but it might bend you know curve its trajectory and stuff. But there are but there are like you said there are things where you can say like okay I can you know for every million tons I can then leave one you know one ton there into orbit whatever you basically want to build is something another beam on the other side that slows you down. So the point I'm trying to get at is that like, you know, you could build a system because again, that's the hardest thing about space. People forget. It's not just the getting there. It's the slowing down. It's the slowing down. That was like when, you know, the starship, which I have, like when that was announced, like I watched physicists, like TV, famous TV personality, physicists, not get it and go like, why don't they just go into orbit? Okay. Where's that fuel come from? You know, the, the goal of the starship was to, go into the Mars atmosphere and to break using that instead of expending fuel, which is just, it's, you know, once you wrap your head around it, you get it. So anyhow, yeah. we let's say, uh, presumably, it either may take a long time, whatever, but we could build a thing on the other end at the other point of a star system you could have within a decade. Mm-hmm. If we had all this energy, we could within a decade, we could have a thing there that you could go travel to Alpha Centauri wow. in five years' time. Okay, let's... uh uh Okay, I'm obsessed with one idea really quick, if we could take it just for a sec. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're talking about like we're talking about transport and landing on another planet, right? 
have we tried to blow up a planet? Have we thought about it? Uh, have we? Ca- well, Emperor, uh, <laughs> there, uh, I know that there is uh, there was what there was that old uh, government plan, potential plan to possibly nuke the moon if need be. Um, but have we really tried to crack open one of those gobstoppers? Um, the the challenge is just the amount of energy you need. Yeah. You know, That's so it's. Yeah, the energy all comes down. And that's like the thing with terraforming is you think about like how much effort, how much it takes to this. But that being said, if we are in a world of abundant energy and stuff, and one of the things you can start to do is to figure out like how to, you know, harness other forms of energy. There's a there's a magnetar, right? Magnetar is like this super tight neutron star that's got a magnetic field that spins around. Like they could fit, spin like one rotation like every second or something they're insane you hear this blah, 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 and you realize wow. this is like a compressed star that's spinning there's one that does that has a rotation period of like 22 minutes which is obvious oddly enough the length of a sitcom not saying but just saying is strange and weird but you could say oh how could because people are like oh could that be used for alien signals like oh the energy is too complex like yeah but what if i parked a bunch of stuff in front of it like i created like put some you know energy blocking material, some iron ore or something like this, so that I could create like a Morse code type effect. Like you could start oh, to get into thinking about like like an aperture or shutter sort of system to oh my yeah. gosh, using using a, a magnetar as a as a as an SLR style uh shutter Morse code. Wow. Okay. Uh now when uh a difficult question. I'm not going to hold you to it. Do we find? Would we find other life if we go out, explore the stars, explore the like? We probably won't find humanoid life, huh? It would, but we might find bacteriums. We could find. I, I think anything's on the table. I mean, the the how 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 far out we have to go to find interesting life is going to be the big question. That, that are there going to be are there are there in other intelligent beings and systems out there? I think it's highly likely. I, I I can think of arguments for why there wouldn't be like certain amount of complexity, whatever. But I think it's highly likely. Um, the 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 Drake equation, the Fermi paradox, like excuse me, the Fermi paradox. I never really took much into that because I thought that if you were, if you thought about sufficiently advanced technologies or comp- like the problem, the Fermi paradox was like, why haven't we seen footprints for them or whatever? Yeah. And you know, the, it, it's just, the problem is, is that like, we, it's trying to imagine like, yeah, if there are, if, if, you know, there are advanced aliens, why don't we find railroad tracks on the moon? Well, well, why would we find railroad tracks? Yeah, but, well, like, why, why, if that's not what they say is they go, why don't we find footprints or whatever? It was like, why would we find those things? Like you're, you're assuming from a 20th century point of view, the things that we would find if 20th century people were doing this, then yes. Because right. I mean, people who were. Because hu- humanity's uh, footprint extends to Earth and the moon. And we've shot out, a, we, you know, we spat a couple of boys out, out to the different parts of the universe. But it's not like we're exactly making a huge beacon across the across the soul across the, the the universe you know uh the this is why we need this is why we need a death star this is why we need a death star andrew we need to blow up planets we need to make ourselves known in the universe um what if, oh mean, my gosh what okay this okay this could be like an interesting sci-fi thing right you have like the battle between like destroying parts of the universe to attract attention to humanity and and obvious and like the you know the sanctity of the matter of of letting things exist. So there was a study that just came out asking what public what there was public support for, and they showed that support for Moon and Mars landings were low, but one of the top priorities was asteroid prevention. Mm. Okay, that, it's, and and if you could just. Beep, 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 just yeah, you, you, you get him dead center, and then, and then it turns into like a beautiful like uh, 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 what is it a, sh- a, sh- a shower, a meteor shower, basically. 
um, you know, and then do it on the Fourth of July. You know, then you got fun for the whole family. You know, I mean, this is um, taking a very pro militarization stance today on the Weird Things program, but uh, it would be interesting to blow a planet up. Yeah, I think uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> They're calling me Bryce Vader. Don't want to right? kill anybody's dream, <laughs> um, but. Again, it all takes energy. But again, I'm the one to start the conversation about imagining having abundant energy. But if we do have that, like if we have, if we can go out there and we can build space stations, I think we're going to have an easier job. I think it'll be easier building like orbital rings and things in that nature. Yeah. Because terraforming. <laughs> it, it's probably a better idea to no. make a very big light bulb than to blow up a planet. <laughs> Perhaps. Yeah. Sorry, I cut, I cut you off. Though. Yeah, no, no, no. I'll, I'll find. Uh, I, that's why you get people start talking about orbital rings and things like that, because then it gets to be, you know, a, a different sort of thing where it's, it's more, it's actually strangely more practical. So mm-hmm. if we get into that world, but if we keep going out there, we're going to probably find habitable worlds. How, how far out do you have to go for habitable world? And may you, might you find things that are just adjacent? It's just a little bit will take to be able to, to make it more hospitable, you know, that that's going to be an interesting factor. And you look at, you know, uh, within our own, you know, within 10 light years, you know, like you extend that outward, what is there? But also if you start building a civilization, you start building a civilization that basically goes from point to point to point and can relay it. Then you can start talking about the idea of transmitting, you know, our personalities or whatever, you know, at the speed of light, you know, you build a station antenna on, oh. you know, Alpha Centauri and Bryce wants to go there. So digital Bryce just gets teleported to there, which is an old idea in science fiction, gets teleported to there. And we spin up a version of you there. Hmm. I, gosh, I'm always so, so, uh, I always think about like, but, but, the, but, the, but the consciousness, like, like, I feel like if I did that, Bryce here on Earth would be like, oh, okay, there's another Bryce out there on Mars having a good time. But we, I don't know, we'll, but, we'll solve it. We'll find a way to solve it. That that's yeah. But if you if if you imagine that you Bryce gets to live a very long time and has backup copies and stuff like that too on Earth, okay. So you you get to have a very long time, and so you send virtual Bryce goes off to go there, and and keep streaming data back. By the way. You know, you go to sleep at night and, you know, Alpha Centauri Bryce experiences are being loaded into your memory. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Here, here, here's something. Like, right now, generally speaking, one person has the sensations of about one person, right? You, uh, but in a world where maybe there is... is some sort of data transmission like that. Uh, what is to stop us from becoming a multi-sensational species, right? That the the idea of having a virtual, having another Bryce, but then maybe you're both of them. I'm describing the Borg now. I think. I think I'm inventing a Borg. Um, but wouldn't that be? Uh, well, that's a collective. Oh, okay. Pardon me. But but uh, I mean. I think about, and maybe it's because I'm in my 30s, but I feel like the thing I think a lot is, I wish, I just, I want more time. There's just not enough time in the day to do all these things I want to do. But if I, if you have I agree, I think, I think, no, you could do that. I mean, I think part of it is like, you might have your digital self. Like, I would love to, you know, like to code. And so while I do one thing, Instead of multitasking, I would love to just be able to have like digital Andrew say, "Okay, go, go, keep." God, this is when I do this, <laughs> uh, my wide view here for our audio listeners. I have the uh, Apple camera feed function using my iPhone as my camera, and when I put my arms over my head, it just zooms way out. <laughs> um, so, uh, according to ChatGPT, by the way, if we spent traveling three years at seventy percent the speed of light, our relative time would be about two years. Okay, that's not bad for a for a you know a seed for a seed trip. That's not bad. Well, it would be it would be if there was a slowdown six years. It maybe be four years. You might be spending four years on board. Mm. Now, for comparison, yeah, let's do uh, like how long would it take to get to Mars today? Or uh, 
Oh, using like beam, like propulsion, or just traditional Ours. existing yeah. um, technologies. I mean, you're you're talking best case scenario, like three months or something. Okay, 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 okay. They're you're, they're like fast intercept or fast intercepts and stuff like that. You can do depends upon you know how close things are, but you know. okay. So it's fifty years. We're we're fifty years on. We're doing it. We're we're. We're spreading. We've got a little. We've got a trail of planets that we're 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 charting our path through. Um, how does? Well, first off, where do, where do you sit? Do you want to be on the avant garde and jumping from new planet to new planet, or do you want to do you want to settle down on a different planet? Do you want to settle down on the first new planet, or are you uh are, are you are you chasing that new planet high? I I wonder if I'm just as much a victim of my times as everybody else is when I think about the way I think about stuff. And and you know, a when we think about space exploration, whatever, we think of like Starship Enterprise kind of thing going out there, which we know from the practical point of view, yeah, if you're using, you know, antimatter or something like that. You can get things to get go pretty fast, but we we don't we don't currently have a good idea for how to do like a warp, right? There's all sorts of theoretical stuff, but there's nothing that makes us think that this actually is a thing you could do. But it would be cool. So let's forget that for a moment. I'm saying it's not possible. I'm just saying it's like we just don't have, you know, Alkyberry drives, all this sort of stuff. They all have their they're all just purely theoretical. Yeah. If you say, okay, we live in the world of where you can't go fast in the speed of light, but you want to explore the universe, the galaxy you know, a imagine building a massive thing, a superstar destroyer startup sized system thing that gets launched from our solar system via a humongous solar array, powering beam propulsion, whatever. I mean, things that are going to literally be, you know, the size of collectors, the size of the planet Earth, humongous massive scale. We go, ah, oh, that's too hard. We can't do it. It's like you can see parts of Dubai on from space. You can see cities from space. We can do this. We we do these things now. We call them cities and highway. We do this sort of scale. Building in space is obviously a hundred x harder to do, but compared to what we do now versus what our ancestors did, the idea of this age of acceleration, whatever. So imagine you build some system like this thing like this. And this thing is basically, it's just going to go straight on out there. Maybe it's going to hit some other star system and eventually to, you know, hit, kind of do a rendezvous with Rama kind of trajectory where it's going to come, you know, bounce around and come back, come back to Earth in a couple thousand years or something. But you could build this platform and we could talk to it all along, send information to it. So if we built this big, huge, you know, platform or whatever on there, they can then launch other craft. Can other do stuff? Maybe there's ways they can get materials by using like lasers and shooting asteroids and collecting particles, which would be moving it ridiculously fast. We did it, but there might be a thing that you just build, you know, uh, not an arc, not like this, but a a basically a fast moving factory platform type thing that you can just send out to space mm. and then mm. launch missions from there. Well, and. I I wonder. I mean, at what point, if if we really do assume, uh, you know, uh, un, a high amount of energy and technological uh, uh, capability, because we don't have, we don't really have mega projects. I mean, we've got we've got big. We've done big things. <laughs> to put that on humanity's box. We've done big things, but. I'm I'm I, I'm not at least not able to come up with something that say took multiple generations of people to create to initially build right mm -hmm. the Burj Khalifa took a long time but it was not a generational project is yeah. is space and the universe is that the the dividing line to that point where where we have to say we collectively want this goal so much so that we that we can 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 sign up 
generation, a, a, another generation or generations of people to build either, you know, this, 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 this platform like you're talking about, or, or, I mean, at some point, like, why don't we just put boosters on the earth? Well, there's, okay, there's probably a lot of great reasons not to do that, but. Well, I don't, I don't expect sign on from everybody on this thing. I don't, I don't think that like I, I, in my world, it's either nations, sovereign funds, corporations, or whatever, the tremendous amount of money. And let me give you, you know, a hypothetical example. Sure. What is the most valuable company on the planet right now? Uh, uh, is it Apple? Cause Apple certainly got the most money. It is Apple. Apple, I mean, there there might be privately held, but as far as we know, Apple is valuation at like currently like three trillion dollars. Okay, Apple has Apple spent billions, billions with a B, on a self driving or a car a car project to try to build their own car, which as far as we know has been dwindled down considerably in size. They spent billions on it, and it never affected their bottom line. And you think about that's the and when you imagine a thousand x scale over that, like like we go oh but that's really like okay, there was a question of once upon a time not that long within within the time frame of this podcast would we ever see a trillion dollar company? Okay, well we have seen a trillion dollar company. We've seen that in the form of first Apple and then Apple then then it was oh wow then we saw what about two trillion and then it passed three trillion and nobody paid attention. It was like oh yeah well that's just Apple. What I'm saying is the amount of revenue and money they have is humongous. So when you imagine companies at that scale are bigger, which they will be bigger, there are going to be more than that. There are going to be $10 trillion companies. There are going to be trillionaires. There are going to be people who are going to have this sort of wealth that we can't even conceive of now. But also in an age of like extreme abundance where things become much more efficient to do. So you don't need everybody on the planet to sign on to it. You just need, you know, you have the, the, you know, the leading space effort on the planet I'm, you know, funded by, you know, Elon Musk, you know, SpaceX. Mm -hmm. And so I think you get to a point where uh, you don't, everybody on earth does not have to agree to this. It just has to be somebody wants to put the money to it. Hmm. I I guess so. I get, but when we, when we, you know, I just have to imagine that when this, when there, that there's a scale tipping point where, where the magnitude of everything that we're talking about is so large that it has to be viewed in a completely different um, perspective to the way that we do it now, you know, like I, like if like if we're making like a big, I I don't know, I have to imagine that there's something, I, there's something planetary sized that I think humans can could get behind generally broadly speaking we're, we're not we we we're if, if it's going particularly if it's going to affect the planet we're not that was like the problem i always had on the space elevator is that even if you solve the physics of a space elevator we live in there are 100 plus countries on our planet there's going to be people going to be affected differently the potential damage that could cause by this thing collapsing whatever could be huge it was just not going to be a thing that at this point that we were going to do and also, my argument was reusable rockets were going to be. I was the, our first arguments. Our new listeners here on the show were me arguing that reusable rockets were the way forward because space elevators were just they were not the practical thing that we thought they would be. Um, right. But that and it's just it's for many things. It's just you're not going to get the sign on for that. Who gets to control access? You know, who gets to do this? Who gets all that? It's just it's just not a realistic sort of thing, which is fine because. I'd rather have a bunch of people kind of pursuing their own agendas than everybody agree to one because if it's the wrong agenda, then you there's nothing you can do to stop it. So then, as human, okay. So as you hum- let's you know we're we're let's say as we cast a streak out from Earth toward through planet or planets um, external. Mm-hmm. Uh, what what is the thing? What do they do when they land? What do they do? Do they do they do they stake a claim for the country, the company, the planet? Do they do they do you build a fence? Is there a is there is there a registrar of we have, the planets and who own I, who own them? So that gets that's a great question. So you have to ask that gets to the underlying point. What would be the underlying goal of this? And I have two. Okay, okay? Uh, three actually. Okay. One, knowledge, acquire knowledge about the universe, but they're all equal, okay? 
Second is to expand the human experience, to expand the, hu the human's experience. It's why we just don't do probes. It's why we want to put people out there to expand the human's experience. Three, to make humanity flourish. I want to see humanity flourish throughout the universe. I don't mm. think that we're likely to run into intelligent aliens anytime soon or in our neighborhood. And so I would like to see humanity flourish and spread across things. I look at the wonderful things we produce, the wonderful things we're able to do. I think that the human experience is an awesome thing. I like to wake up every day uh, and I would like to see that expand. So what does that mean? How do we make that happen? So that would be colonizing, building, building colonies and creating new worlds and creating new places, new places for people to live. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 fascinating because because you know the the motivations that you you've you've got are they're they're human they're they're are they're kind of yes. a species level thing where like uh, there there's there are many much longer conversations I'm sure with more qualified people about uh, colonizing earth colonialism on earth but I, I see you in our chat says but what if they're just tall blue cat people they're and, not human and then and then we then we we know but then we we learn we take we learn from the lessons of the past but we have no reason to think that they're out there you know science fiction we only science fiction in storytelling we only use we we we, we favor the conflicts we're familiar with and the ones we're familiar with are encountering other intelligent species. I think when we go to worlds that have other ecosystems, things like this, yeah, we're not going to really want to try to change those. But if we go to ones, if if you had an Earth-sized Mars, you know, that you could tip over and turn into a habitable world, then yeah, you do it. If you come to a place like that and there's a bunch of, you know, ant people walking around building, you know, stuff, hands off. Like, like that seems to me like don't do it. There's going to be plenty of other spaces to do it. And maybe what we're doing is building habitats in other places. But the idea is that we we get stuck. Like I'm like, yeah, if we come into contact, then yeah, we shouldn't. But not leaving, not not going out there, that's not an excuse to not go out there. Well, what if we meet somebody? Well, if, we, if we're ethical enough to decide not to leave Earth because we might run into somebody, then we'll be ethical enough to decide don't F with these people when we encounter them. Yeah. Um, and I think that we we there are trillions of planets out there and mo the – the likelihood that we'll ever find intelligent life, the likelihood that we'll in the next 100, 200 years find intelligent life uh, or contact, I mean, physical contact, maybe signals and stuff possible with the idea of physically encounter them seems extremely unlikely to me. So, but we do know that we could encounter thousands of planets and let's let humanity flourish and, and by wildlife on earth too. Yeah. You know, let's let, you know, let's, let's let grizzlies and penguins and everything else flourish as well. Okay. Pitch pitch for a story S literal star-crossed lovers okay two humanoid species living on opposite ends of the universe for whatever reason maybe for like a minute they find out that the other civil civilization does exist out there and they're the only two like humanoid ones and then it becomes a race to become to become the aliens to be the first uh species to get to the other side and then, but then they meet in the middle. Oh, and then they meet in the, the two lovers meet in the middle. They meet in the center of the universe. And then, mm -hmm. uh, and then that gets radiated out into the rest of the world. Love, peace, unity, respect, plur happens throughout all of creation. End of book. There you go. Write it. <laughs> Write it up. Uh, Write it up, chat GPT. Different. When you think about different time frames, so ICU points out, says, well, you should come up with a directive, at least a primary directive. So the prime directive was obviously a very, you know, uh, acknowledgement of, you know, when, when they wrote Star Trek. And I don't know if it was Roddenberry or Coons or whoever came with it, the specific little writer came up with the idea of the prime directive. But um, in Star Trek, you know, the idea is like, ah, we shouldn't interfere with the development of another culture. Okay. Now, as you know, Star Trek is all about deciding when to break it <laughs> because they always <laughs> decide, well, in this exception, they're about to be doing this. And then sometimes it becomes this like, oh, my God, I, I death before you violate it or, and, yeah, you know, I made it, I called it. And then like, ah, ha, ha, carry on. So it's always been a very loose thing in there because the problem with the prime directive is let's say we encounter, you know, uh, the South, you know, we counter Earth circa like, you know, 
17, you know, 1805 and slavery and all that. It's a real thing. Oh, yeah. What do we do? Ooh. And we're like, hey, um, man, we we could help boost their economy and slavery would go away. <laughs> what do we do? Do we say we don't want to interfere with the natural course of things? Mm. It, it becomes an interesting thing. And when you look at it on a big, broad level of like, ah, oh, let's not interfere with indigenous Americans and stuff. But when you start to think like, ah, it's 1939. You know, and we see that, you know, 7 million people are about to be exterminated for their religious views. Sure. What do we do? What? Do, ah, I can't interfere with the natural course of things. Like, like, why not? Why can't we? You, the answer would be that because we don't know how things would turn out. That's fair. So then you say, okay, what, what, is, what is the ethical thing? And my solution is like, what I, it, what I, as a Jewish person living in a, you know, part of Germany, want you to, the Federation to interfere Yes. Yes, very much. I would like you to interfere. Please interfere. Mm. Ah, but you don't know what's going to happen. You know what? I'm going to get put onto a train and I will never know what's going to happen. So uh, I, I will take this. I think it comes down to that. It's like my problem with like Day of the Earth stood steel, still is you get like this robot and this humanoid come down on Earth and are going to pat, hold judgment on us. And they're judging us by the actions of our governments. And some of these governments were not democratically elected. And it would be like judging a Chinese citizen by the ccp that's not fair it's not fair to them yeah. you know if you're if you're a victim of a dictatorship or you're a victim of a power structure why would you kill everybody on the planet every child everybody else because the people in power like the, to me the better system should be like oh you guys don't come to agreement i'm gonna kill every politician okay now i'm on board <laughs> not really well, i'm just saying is a foot story and 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 uh, i think there's an interesting perspective if you flip flip the script on it what if a humanoid species comes to earth and starts to say like, Hey, you know, the way that you're doing food is wrong. Hey, you're doing food like all wrong. You're killing animal, you know, it, like something that we are okay with today, like killing animals or, mm -hmm. or even dying. Just even the fact that humans can die, who knows? Maybe they like, you guys are still dying or like, I, I think there would, there would be a lot of, preoccupation of of any sort of advice an alien species tries to give us um and and yet i guess i guess i guess you get into this idea of like who knows who knows what's who's got the right history and experience right you know you talk about the historical world war ii uh concentration camp example and like yeah like if an alien came came down and said hey if you if you stop this, you're going to save millions of people's lives from another human's own actions. Um, I think there's an understandable trade there on the scale there, but, but, but it, 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 I think there's also outside of just the objective element of, of, of just, this is the timeline and this is, these are the actions. There is an emotional element that I think we as, as an interfering species or as an exterior species coming in would really have a lot of friction with like we already don't like listening to the humans on earth why the hell are we going to listen to an alien no that that would be that, that it would that's where persuasion and ideas to give choices so for instance if i was if we if we came to a version of earth and it's 1939 everything's about to go to war right and and we can say hey listen um uh if we let, let's say we have really advanced technologies whatever and then we can come out and point and say, like, hey, listen, we, we don't think you guys should go to war. Uh, Germany, we don't think it's really a good idea that you, you know, start exterminating people. So what we're going to do is, one, uh, we'll give everybody on the planet, you know, because look at all the war refugees. We'll give you the option to hop on board a spaceship and we're going to take you someplace else. You know, you know, do you, do you want to avoid this entirely? You know, we'll build you a new city. building. We're going to give you the personal option. Get the idea is give people personal choices if you want to do this. You just what we tried to do in World War II, once we did this, we tried to, we did these flights to bring these boat flights and stuff to try to fly children to safety and whatnot and people out of there so they could avoid the conflict. That's historically a thing that's happened where, hey, this is going to get ugly. Let's give you a way out. And that's why you have refugee camps, things like this. So we can say, yeah, we're going to create like the most, the most awesome refugee camp you can imagine. You can just come chill out there. You can go home afterwards if you want. It's totally cool, whatever. That would be an option. That would be a thing of saying, okay, we're not going to tell your governments what to do. We're not going to stop them there. You know, and that that would be an easy option. Another option, it gets more complex. They're like, yeah, like, uh, you know, we have a 
we have a shield technology. You know, we'll give you the shield technology and you can protect your cities from getting bombed. Mm. And if you start using this in an offensive way, like using to protect your military bases that you launch missions from, we'll just shut it off and it won't work. They could start imagining, you know, solutions, but the simplest is to give each person a personal choice to say, yeah, I, I want it to, I'm bowing out of this, guys. I don't want to be part of this conflict. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. That brings up like, yeah. like my, my thing, like, you know, we have, there are cultures right now, there's still some kind of like uncontacted cultures on our planet and like tribes and stuff. I think in the Andalusian islands, uh, yeah, there was that story a few years ago of some guy dying or getting very seriously injured because he tried to contact one of those tribes. Uh, and they're very... They... Well, the like Norm, whatever, Rockefeller, like he got probably eaten by them, you know, and, and that was a case where like they had been attacked in prior by some, you know, European and then he showed up and they thought it was, you know, like they, they're, they're, they're not an evil people, you know, they're not, they're not... Although many of their practices might be described as evil, as many of ours have too. And that's another thing too. It's like there is like, you know, uh, if you, you know, if we went back and saw like Mayan culture as it was being practiced, we'd be like, ah, this is horrific, as would many European practices. But I guess my point there is like, man, is it fair to like some 12 year old kid born into that culture that has no idea anything else that's out there? Is it fair to say, yeah, we're not going to. We're going to go out of our way to not let you know that there's a thing called TikTok, and YouTube, and all these other cool stuff that you could actually have a longer lifespan, be able to select your own mate. Mm. Is that fair? Well, and to what ends? You know, I, 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 I like it. It does. It, it sounds idyllic, but it also sounds like. Uh, it sounds like maybe what could be said if you wanted to make a new slave trade, an interstellar slave trade of. Oh, no, I even meant right now. I meant like right now. Like if we, if we, uh, if like those con, like you take those, the, you know, a, a tribe like that, you know, mm -hmm. are we behaving in an ethical way? Like, oh, yeah, we should let them develop. Like, I don't know if you're like a 10 year old girl that's going to be born, in, you know, 10 year old girl in that culture that's about to be married off in two years and whatnot, and maybe going to have to do a life of suffering. Are we, would, are we, are are we is it ethically if we have the ability to give them a choice are we behaving ethically because i wouldn't want that choice denied to me well and i don't what is our what is our position to inter to intervene in the first place i mean uh there it's not like the more civilized world doesn't have its own atrocities that uh are are unaddressed or unsolved like in the we get to say, "Hey, you have to put a shirt on," because I, I have a, I have a civic. No, I'm not saying that but, we tell anyone. No, I'm not. No, I, I've no, never I, said you have to tell anybody anything. My, my point is, should we? If, could we? If we could, if they had a written language, if we could leave some pamphlets that said, "Hey, if you want to tap out, let us know." Like that's my point. Is to say, like, 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 it's not forcing them to do a thing, but to mm -hmm. say that, like, you know, it should. It, it, what, what an ethical thing to be to be to allow people to have the same sort of self determinism that you and I have. Yeah. Well, and and it is it is this conversation is difficult because I'm sure I because I, I know I know very little about any of these actual tribes, so I can only speak very broadly. Um, but they're also human beings. They are not aliens. There's they have motivations and drives and for whatever reason for whatever circumstances and, and events that happened this these tribes exist and these are these are the way that they do things um uh and i guess i guess i think there's just like a question of maybe sovereignty i don't know like well is, okay so that gets into it so it, it imagine next door you know, there was a big, huge warehouse building and you found inside of there were several generations of people been living there and were not allowed to go free. Were, that was the whole world they knew. Everything was inside of there. OK. Uh, and there were children there born into it, whatever, die into that. You'd call the cops. Right. Uh, if yeah, if there was if I thought there was a crime, if I thought like, yeah. 
I, I think in prison, you know, I think, I think like they're marrying children off at 12, they're doing this, you know, whatever mm-hmm. they're the, 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 the infant mortality rate was, was ridiculously high, whatever. I mean, you'd, mm-hmm. you know, we'd want to do something you know, about that. Right. And, and we've had that examples at like parts of like very like rural parts of American Appalachia and stuff. And sometimes like this, we find out like these little communities and stuff that are heavily inbred or whatever. And we say like that's not right, and also, mm-hmm. but like if you found these people contained there, you would think, well, the moral thing is because not just because you don't call the cops because ah, it is a law that is being broken. You're like, oh man, this is wrong. A wrong is being done to these people. Sure, uh, though, uh, it, uh, not even though, but I also think it might be analogous to to think about it on the country scale, right? Like. What I I I don't know the atrocities or or what we would consider atrocities that happen in any in any particular tribe or or group of people. Um, hmm. It's a it's a thinker. <laughs> it's a thinker. It is. It is. It is because because you you have to come to your point, and that's well. The, well I I think the thing I'm trying. To nibble around and maybe I'll just dive into it. It's like um, when we have a disagreement with another country, we don't. Well, I, 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 in a refugee war situation, you do try to get people out of there, but I think there's there's also something to be said about like, well, okay, but can we not erase the things that they've done and make their life better? Is there a way to? bring them up so or that do, gets yeah. part mm-hmm. part of the crux are our, our the way we behave sort of now is when we deal with sort of these groups we recognize these groups is we'll sort of say we don't want to erase that culture we don't want to erase that things so we'll minimize contact and we'll do that we look at you know we look at like the anti-missionary position the missionaries you know kind of reached out made contact brought people into larger world for better for worse it's complex here we have this attitude like oh we don't want to preserve that and my problem is that's treating people more like animals than like people. Like my problem is that the, the, our our policy for people shouldn't be the same one as if we find a new species of wolverine. Our policy for people to me is to respect the individual's rights, the individual's you know a, a freedom of choice and autonomy. Mm-hmm. And we don't do that level because we say, oh, we want to preserve this culture. But like, but I don't. It, but I I left. Yeah. Was it? I left home. I, I went out in the world because I knew that was an option open to me, and I did not want to have to preserve my culture. Did not want to have to do that. I I, I carved my own path because I had the freedom to do that. And for me to say I get this, but other people don't, I don't like that. I I I hmm, I think there's a dissonance that I'm trying to unpack between um something so horrific uh, or, or un un tasteful things happening uh, in a part of the world that are so bad that require intervention, but an intervention that is opt is, is optimal is, is like, it's bad, but yeah. that's so, hmm, uh, that. So, so let me, well, let me try to address that too. Cause okay. the challenge is this, is that we are very bad at intervention. We suck at intervention. Okay. Um, we, we are very, very bad at it. We, we don't succeed at it. And in a very much cases like this, you know, when we, when we try to liberate countries and stuff that aren't developed countries like our own, it just doesn't work. You know, Japan had a very built, had a big industrial base, was modernizing very quickly. We went to war with them, defeated them, then went in and said, okay, we're going to make you more aligned with us in certain ways. They were already on a path of alignment that, that the war with us was just kind of like in a kind of more of a, an aspect of when you become an empire or whatever kind of thing. But the long term, we were headed towards alignment anyways. Other countries, not so much. Other cultures, not so much. When you look at like Latin America, when you look at the conquistadors came through there and, and life under the Mayans and Aztecs is not fun. Like we were able to take over those empires so quickly because everybody around them hated them, helped them. But it wasn't like life turned out awesome for those people afterwards because you had Western disease You had enslavement, you have these other issues that, but after a period of time when, you know, when slavery was abolished, you know, throughout the continent, et cetera, 
you still had people who were indigenous peoples who were living on the frontier. And it's a very, was a very, very difficult and still is a very difficult sort of world for them because they are very steeped in one culture here and there's Western culture on the other side and you get stuck in there. And often the only sort of opportunities there are not good ones. You know, we've seen this in Australia. You have Aboriginal people that have had a culture that's remained largely the same, same for like tens of thousands of years. And for many Aboriginal is, you know, adopting to Western culture is very, very challenging because it's just so radically different. So on the frontier can just be a horrible place that can last a long time. And and you could arguably say that it took Europeans thousands of years to overcome being on the frontier and get in, on board. So yeah. I would say that that's the other side of it is to say like, yeah, we can, we can intervene or say something, but what's our track record? Forget, for, forget the genocide and enslavement. Even post that, are we, you know, are we better at that? You know, we, we, we were involved in Afghanistan for decades, and then we left Afghanistan. Is Afghanistan better now than it was 20 years ago? Like, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not going, is, I do not, I can't, I do not know okay. to know that. I, I certainly think that, you know, it felt like there was a lot more Taliban power now than there was before. And Wait, so, so I, I guess then uh, not as an objective, uh, not as an objection, but as as just a clear, uh, 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 just a probing question, I guess. Um, mm-hmm. Do do you think, in general, humanity's track record with uh, refugee operations is good is good enough compared to uh, intervention? Oh, I think yeah, I think. I mean, I think I think that's a different thing. Like, obviously, we could handle that much better, but I do think that we we our heart is in the right place for the most part with that. We try, we do try to do that. And that's different when some people say, "I want to like, I want to up and get out of here." Like, our country is filled with refugees and people who came here. And part of it too is we have an assimilation thing where, you know, the 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 people that have had the the the, the worst end of it were the Native Americans who weren't refugees. You know, they were the ones that you know were you know were here before us. And so that was certainly different, but people who sort of said, yeah, I'm going to hop on a boat and go over there. I'm, I just want to live. I don't need to preserve anything. I'm willing to adopt. So I see you ask the question, what if the U S stumbled across a small country on the verge of turning communist, leave them be, let it happen. So first, what does it mean to be on the verge of turning communist? Are they about to take a national vote to decide that they are going to become communist? Or is there a small military faction that is going to try to seize control of power and turn them communist? And that's the challenge. It's, it's one thing if somebody says, oh, we're going to vote this way. It's another thing when a small faction is going to force themselves onto the rest of everybody else. And that historically was what got us into Vietnam. It's what has got into Korea because it wasn't a unanimous decision. There is a South and North Korea because South Korea said, no, we don't want this. There was a South Vietnam, and South Vietnam, that was who our allies were, is that we were the ones supporting them as they were trying to prevent the country from being turned, taken over by Ho Chi Minh, et cetera. So right or wrong, separate question, but the point was is that both these cases were – it wasn't that there was a widespread vote. It was one faction fighting another faction, and so we sided with the faction that was in theory pro-American, but often that's backfired because – Pro America doesn't necessarily mean pro good. Well, uh, and, it could be complex, and and that that's something that 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 ticked for me is like we we've kind of turned this into uh, under, understandably how we got here a more U.S. centric um, approach to this, I guess, where I think there is a human a human species layer when we talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, a, either, you know, these tribes and groups of people across the world or potential uh, uh, p- potential un- uncontacted life in out in the universe. Um, uh, what it, What is our role well, of I... intervention and, and, and getting involved or making contact at all? If we find another species, should we even make contact? Are we allowed to make contact? Are we should we should we even allow I, ourselves to be? That's why I. I like to raise it to the individualist point of view. Uh, I don't think by addressing the sovereignty of, a, and that that's been my my criticism. Of a lot of science fictionists, like I said, David Earth could still is that they they decided that the, the unit to measure us by was the sovereign powers in control of us, which seemed like a horrible idea. That would be like deciding, like oh, eighteen oh five, like oh, slavery is bad. Well, we're going to kill everybody, including all the slaves. Like 
wait a second. Like what? I, I, you know, like I don't have a choice in this. And so that's where I say, what's, what's the simplest solution? You address it on an individual level. Individuals give you a choice. So in the case of a, if, if the U.S. stumbled across a country that's going to turn communist, if it's, a, if it's going to be a democrat, democracy or whatever, they're going to do it, fine. All we want to do is watch out for the atrocities. All we want to do is make sure that they don't do whatever the communist power does and start killing people in mass, whatever. My attitude is like, uh, well, if, if you're going to turn a bunch of you know, foreign-owned property into state property, then compensate for us this. If the people are voting for this, then like, it's not going to be our position to intervene. Uh, we think it's stupid. You're going to be poor. But that's fine. Just don't kill anybody, and you know we'll be standing by. It's also because otherwise, you know, that's interfering with self determinism. But I, I, I do think there's a little world policiness of, of like, I don't know. It's we're, uh, I don't know. It seems presumptuous to to to. To make to offer that to to let there be a choice for there to, to be a choice on an individual level like I understand I guess when when now we just get into like actually just describing <laughs> geopolitical politics but like yeah but my point I guess the thing is the way the way that I would apply it is what would you want in that situation would would you when do you not want a choice tell me when you don't want a choice and people always say, I want a choice. People always want a choice. So I have to, if you're asking, what's the ethical thing for me to do? If, if, if we were a super intelligent species, you know, we, if we encountered some other culture that was like horrific, and you're saying, what's the ethical thing for me to say? Well, I'm now for the individuals a choice. Like, hey, everybody, like, you want to bow out? Comp, hop aboard a teleporter. Well, you're free I, to do that. I, I think it's tough when we don't, when, when we aren't able to be more specific about that. Like, um, I think it would be tough to say, like, hey, no, like, slavery is kind of not cool at all. Like, I, 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 I think there are certainly a lot of failure points that, that you, <laughs> that, that, that make it tough to go to every individual and give them a, di a direct choice, um, to, to, and the, and then like I don't know I did, it, 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 but, but do, do you at least do, do you get what I'm I'm kind of coming at here like if like if slavery is so bad why don't you just stop it like well because the guys who benefit from slavery don't want to stop it like I well that's my point is, is to say that like if I was if if we were a super advanced civilization and we came in contact with somebody else was doing it like. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, that's the problem is that they're not going to stop. That's why I'm going, I mean, individual, like each person, you know, like sitting there in the field, pop up and say, Hey, listen, um, did you and your family, do you want to get out of this? Here's my ship, hop on board. You're free. That's what we did. That was partially where we had the underground railroad and stuff. That was a solution when we couldn't, you know, eliminate slavery mm -hmm. was to let's go, let's, let's just create options for people to get the bug the hell out of there. And like, I love that. I think morally that's, that's a great choice is to say, not kidnap, not Yank people out of there against their will or whatever, but to say, you want to get on here? Come on. Interesting. You know, at the end of the Vietnam yeah. War, you know, we we flew tens of thousands of refugees to here because there were South Vietnamese people who were very anti-communist, very against that. They were like, yeah, I don't want to be in this country now that's going there. Part first, because they're going to murder me. Second, this is going to suck. And so we're like, yes, come here. We had all the boat people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, Cuba. When Cuba, we did the the Mario boat, boat lift. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -mm. That was what were you gonna say? No, no, no. Go ahead. But yeah, that was we're like, hey, like uh, you don't want to be in Cuba. Anybody hop on a board? Window at the time. Of course, Cuba like emptied out their asylums and prisons and stuff and sent that to us too. We had a ton of people who came to South Florida who were like, yeah, we do not want to be part of this. And like, yeah, like, I'm all for stuff like that. That's great. You know. At, yeah, there's there are a million more threads to pull on this. I yeah, I, I can only see more and more weeds in front of us. <laughs> yeah, remember when we the Berlin Wall? Uh, we were helping people cross. They were trying to stop people. Okay. Yeah, I'm just just saying that that, that at, we ethically you say you know when you're trying to decide like well, how do you behave like so anyhow. Um, 
you want to wrap this up? You have a pick? Uh, yeah, I got a pick. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, you know what? This here we go. Um, I this is a new uh, show on Netflix. It's a uh, it's a cooking competition show. Uh, it's called Five Star Chef. Uh, it's pretty good. It's um, I think Michelle Rue is the the main host, and um, they bring on these people and and really focus on them making very very high end five star um, caliber meals. Um, and I think it it is interesting in that it is very much it's kind of plain. It's kind of boring almost in that way. Like here is your, here are two challenges every episode. Here's a smaller one and a bigger one. Uh, cook the best food. And they'll have like, they'll have uh, uh, different challenges that they have to try to keep things to. But it's not like uh, who can blind, who can blindfold cook an egg best or, or anything weird like that. It's about these people actually vying to run one of these high end uh, restaurants. Uh, and so, yeah, I don't know. I think it's good. And it's a, it's a pretty easy watch. Five star chef. Well, I have a uh, channel. Let me pull this up. Um, get the name right. I I don't know much about who made the channel. As far as I know, you know, it could be a cult or whatever, but man, they put out a ton of content. Some of it's pretty good. Um, and that is marvelous videos. Hmm. Cause like, like if you ever wanted to know, like, uh, basically, uh, why Constantine's rotten cancer lungs haven't killed him. What are the insane hidden powers of Darth Vader? Uh, you know, what would happen if Bright Burns, evil Superman, you know, fought like Superman himself, you know? Okay. Uh, what is, you know, why is it almost impossible to kill Plastic Man? <laughs> like, they just take these questions. Maybe you never asked, but they just do these. They put out like several videos a day. They have an insane track record of putting out videos. Wow. They have a lot of really fun sort of like things. And then it just basically, it's like people doing book reports about these characters and topics. A little bit dry sometimes, whatever, but it can be kind of interesting. So that's one of my... One of the channels I've enjoyed watching it. And another one too, like, man, um, uh, Beast Philanthropy. You subscribe? Uh, is that is that a Mr. Beast thing? That's his philanthropic, ch- philanthropic channel where all the proceeds they make from that goes to help. And they do things like, you know, buy artificial legs for amputees and, you know, provide internet to remote islands or give away sneakers and stuff. So he gets these corporate sponsors who come in and either they're going to supply a product and money, or they're going to help pay for something or whatever Mm -hmm. and helps to kind of, you know, improve the quality of life for people. Neat. I Uh, think it's a very, very noble, very generous thing. I've heard it's funny because like you get like, Oh, well, he did it anyway, like hearing aids and somebody who, uh, hearing aids or something like this and that was like oh well that you're telling people they're imperfect i'm like that's not telling people they're perfect it's like giving people a choice it's not like he was tracking people down on the streets who had hearing problems and forcing them to have hearing aids you know as as a, as a child of somebody who needs hearing assistance um i'm very glad it exists for people who have it you know and, and want it if you don't want it then don't use it but offering it to people is not dehumanizing like so it's weird to see some of the criticism against him so beast philanthropy big fan very cool. I didn't realize. I I assu- I just assumed it all went through his Mr. Beast channel, but uh, uh, nope, 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 another channel. Yeah. Wow. There you go. Yeah. So uh, it's been weird. Woo-hoo. Hey, good show, everybody. Good show, Andrew. You're everybody. Good show, Bryce. Thank you. Uh, do you want to do an after things, or should we uh, should we play hooky? Yeah. Let's do one to one. Yeah, I got a, I got a topic for it. If you want to do a quick one, yeah, let's 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 keep it a little shorter though. But yeah, yeah. Uh, give me a sec to go grab a water. Hello, everybody. I am now in charge, so I've got some new rules in place here, and I'm going to go through them in a moment. Um, but first, let's take a quorum. If anybody opposed, say aye. Nope. Fine. We will proceed. So uh, while Bryce is away, we can talk about Bryce facts. Um, fact number one about Bryce is that 
Bryce uh, is able to put up with both Justin and Brian and myself, which is quite a skill. Oh, he's back. So forget we had this conversation. Hey, hey, Bryce. Hello, hello. Let me see here. Let me make my notes so I don't forget what happened in the show. It's still uh, using my journal, by the way. I'm still journaling. Oh, yeah? Uh, I and I'm doing dream journaling. Oh. And uh, I think I forget these for a good reason, because a lot of them are really damn weird. Yeah? Uh, uh, was there a particularly good one re recently? I'm afraid to say anything, but I'll say... Uh, uh, do you have, like, a guilty conscience when you dream? Um... No more. I'm I'm usually the, usually the victim in my dreams. Um. Uh, Explains a lot. <laughs> um. But no, no, not not really. Do do you find that you carry? I don't know. Carry something out of your dreams like that? I mean, I had. I don't want to go into details too much, but it was like, man, I hope nobody finds this because there might be human remains in there, and that would be bad for me. And I'm like, I've never, in my dream, I'm like, I don't think I've killed anybody. I've killed anybody. I don't think I've killed anybody. Like, why am I worried? I don't know. Why are you worried? Mm. Like, uh, all right. Let's, let's just, let's change the topic. Okay. Let's do that. Um, let me see here. Let me just get, make sure I've got these here so I don't forget them. That one and that one. Okay. Awesome. Uh, do you need a break? No, I'm good. Okay. Then uh, I'll catch you in for some after things, why don't I? In three, two. Hello and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Mead, joined by Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hello, Andrew. Bryce, I have a topic and we might pick it up with the other two if they're here because I might have a weird take, but I wanted to get your, your opinion on this first. Sure. Um, have we talked about artificial languages like like fake languages yeah so the definite you'd be like the whole art language is artificial well some are intentionally created some just happen like like it wasn't like there was a effort to like create english english just sort of happened you know we might refine stuff we'll do things like create dictionaries and pronunciations and stuff to sort of say this is what english is but it just a language is just sort of naturally evolved. They're not really directed, with the exception of artificial languages, where somebody says, "These are the words. This is the structure." Now we have a language. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> you know what? I do. I do know a little bit. I once went on a very bad date with a guy who was really into this artificial language he was making, and it was uh, his I, own. It was his own. His own. Uh, yeah, that guy was weird. That guy was not. That was not. So, so I am. I'm. I certainly. I have some rose-colored glasses when it comes to artificial languages, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> or are, are they rose-colored? Are they shade? Uh, so like blood red. I I'm fascinated. When I was a child, I would read. Uh, there's these books. They're called the Stainless Steel Rat series. Um, by Harry Harrison. It was about this sort of like future James Bond type spy guy, this con man spy, and people used Esperanto. And so Harrison, that's where Harrison was big into Esperanto. And Esperanto was like one of the more popular made up languages because the idea of Esperanto was, hey, instead of us fighting over what's going to be the language, French or English or Chinese, whatever, let's just create one simple language that everybody else can learn and then we'll all just learn that. The problem with that is, why not just pick a language, which we did. English pretty much became the default language because other people said, we'll learn that too, whatever. So Esperanto basically lost to English because English became like the standard language. The number of, they'll be like, oh, more people speak this language. There are more primary speakers of other languages. But if you include secondary speakers, English is like the most dominant language on the planet. And it's become, you know, the way you write scientific papers, et cetera. And, you know, these things could change, but English is sort of one out. But Esperanto was an effort to try to create a international language, whatever. It was a noble idea. Like, what if everybody learned it? Because it is like, if we all just learned Esperanto, then anybody could talk to anybody around the world. Well, it's like the same if so we all learned literally English. Literally any English language. Is complex. <laughs> yeah. 
Exactly. But the idea was that they were supposed to simplify it because the English, I can't tell you because I, I, I was a natural to it. I just picked up English without even thinking about it. Yeah. Uh, it is apparently harder than some other languages, but not as more. So mm. there's a couple different ones that have kind of gotten attention lately. Um, one of the more popular ones, did we talk about Tokipona? To- Tokipona? N- no, it does sound... Um... I'm not going to, I don't know what language that might sound like. To, to, tell me about Tokipona. So uh, a linguist by the name of uh, Sonia Lang decided that she wanted to create a language to help her deal with stress and like depression and whatnot. Hmm. And she wanted to simplify her thoughts. So what she decided to do was to create a constructed language. And it, it's, she's a believer in sort of the superior warp hypothesis that language shapes how we think, which there's that's more con- controversy back and forth on that. But anyhow, the idea was to have a language with only like 120 words. Oh, that's a very small and number. there's versions. Of it. Yeah, there's actually like 147 word ones now. So basically it's a, you know, 140 word, whatever language that you can talk about, whatever. And so... It's a very, the idea is just sort of like to simplify your thoughts. And, you know, it could be called baby talk or something, but it's gotten a number of people who follow this or into this because it's a very interesting sort of approach towards stuff. And she was inspired by Esperanto, but again, it's only, it's only like 140 words, you know? So it's a very simple sort of way to sort of learn that. And um, I guess it and has there a are people now. Picto- it has this pictographic, um, uh, the characters, like each word is kind of a very small drawing. Yeah. Is that canonical to that or uh, I'm on Wikipedia. Maybe I picked up the, a different thing. Um, maybe I don't, let me see. Um, yeah, no, I see that there. Uh, but, uh, and, and that's writing, yeah. I guess we're talking, we're, I guess we're kind of talking about speaking and, and structure, but, uh, um, yeah, the, it, it, I, wish i knew more languages i i listen to a lot of japanese music and uh with some songs where it's like i know the translation really really well i'll try to like follow along with the song as the words are coming and sort of translate it in my head but i can tell that just like just structurally it's different just the goals of speaking are different the way that you get across what you're trying to do there's a there's a there's an animus there that's actually different it's a little bit more than just to, to do a lingo like there's a secret sauce that does kind of sometimes make it sound like baby talk but it's also like because you're mm-hmm. saying it in a different order hmm Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that's interesting, and I may have brought this up before, is that children don't pick up languages any faster than we do. We, we think they pick them up. But remember, all if for the amount of time spent immersed in language, children pick it up. At, we pick it up the same rate. So if you're looking to learn a language, don't feel like, oh, I'm too old. That's irrelevant. The only difference is children learn pronunciations, prun- prun- as I mispronounced <laughs> pronunciations. Children learn pronunciations better than we do. But other than that, the data says that we learn at the same rate. It's just that children are kind of like constantly exposed to it. So mm-hmm. anyhow, uh, so Talkie Pwn is interesting because it was, it, I liked it because there was a, the purpose to it was, she said, hey, I want to have a language to use. So when I'm feeling depressed or whatever, I can simplify my thoughts and put myself in sort of a positive sort of way of thinking. There's another one. Um, called uh, that I just heard I didn't heard about before was called uh, Mini the Minimal Language. Min- and this is designed to be a bit more because Tokipona is not really that useful because it's a very it's fine to have I feel good feeling this whatever, but it's not a really efficient way to communicate. So uh, S C Gruget came up with Gruget came up with Minimal, and it has one thousand words. And they're positioning it as an international auxiliary language. And they have, you know, learn it in 20 minutes, advanced. They have their own sort of Duolingo style mini lessons. They have Anki decks, et cetera. So I thought that's an interesting idea. A thousand word minimal language seems like a cool idea. Because there's something Uh neat about, Uh you know, 
just put like, there's 1,000 vocabulary words, learn the structure, learn the words, and boom, you're done. You can be up and running in weeks. That's that's interesting. A like half language that a a, a mini Esperanto, right? Like you just we look. Mm-hmm. We're just really what we're gonna do is we're gonna do some international trade. I'm gonna need to find a restaurant. Like I'm sure there's just a bunch of very specific practical things that would be good for any two humans to speak to each other. I I can see that if it's if it's intentionally condensed, right? If it, if it's a very practical language, because it did, it did sound like the, Toki, mm-hmm. the, the Tokipona one was maybe not, was not as, as practical, was a little more uh, emotional or, or uh, subjective. Yeah. You're going to lose the, the, the advantage of a language like English where you can have a vocabulary of 40,000 words. Is it you, you can express yourself and feel like it's much more efficient to communicate. When you go down to a thousand words, you run into that sort of thing. I may have to say 20 syllables where something else can get it across in three. Yeah. So, well, gosh, um, and then, okay, 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 okay. Cause we were talking about long LLMs. Just let me sci-fi just a little bit here for a sec. What if, um, what if, what if these like, uh, LLMs and machine learning things, what if, those were the interface between people. Just you just think in the thoughts that are most efficient for you. And then the, the blah, 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 will will the babblefish will just make you speak right to the other people. Like that not not the end of language, the beginning of language, the infinity of language. I guess um I didn't. I didn't exactly describe like a conflict or anything, but um, I, 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 I don't know. I in my head, I'm like there was a. There, there's been over the few, over the past few years the uh, Common Core math, right? They're changing the way they teach kids math. The idea being that if you teach them a little bit more like the way we practically think about math, the way that we practically what what we think happens in the brain when you are doing addition, subtraction, whatever, that uh, uh, you could teach, you, there's a better way to teach them. Um, wh- is there, wh- when does language become that? When do, when do you come up with a language or when does someone come up with a language that is more like the thoughts in your head? Uh, or, or what if you don't have, you know, there are plenty of people who don't have a an, an inner an inner voice and an inner monologue. Then uh, maybe what happens with them? How do you, how do you, could you make a language for them without a cognizant voice in their head? Hmm. Well, one, an advantage to learning a language instead of using an intermediary to communicate for you is that in theory expands your ability to think when you know the Japanese word for a thing, or or the word for a thing that doesn't quite have a word in English language. Like I was talking with a friend who's Spanish, uh, and he talked about some of the jokes his friends make. Because yeah, I just can't translate them into English, and and I don't know if it's because they're word puns or something else. Like I suspect they could be, perhaps, but maybe not. I I you know, accept the idea, but for him, linguistically, there was a tough difference between the way these words in his language are used. Because I do think like, yeah, there is like in joke stuff or whatever. And so I think that the advantage of learning is that you now have that capacity instead of a thing that just, I say this thing and somebody else kind of knows what I meant. It means that when you squeeze it down, maybe a lot of that's going to get lost. Mm -hmm. Although a really good language model might be able to say, oh, they use this phrase this way and this, the way this person uses this, this means this. And then you could actually know a lot more. So that's the thing. There's, it could go either way. Yeah. I mean, and, and, um, there are, there's an entire translation industry that is, that wrestles with that balance all the time between literal translations and adaptive translations for the audience. How much do you change what people know wouldn't gosh? Wouldn't it just be so easier if you knew the language? Like it, there, 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 there is something with language. May you know it, English? Maybe English is not the last one. Maybe these aren't the last. Maybe there will be a new one. What? It, well, it, it it's going to evolve. Mm-hmm. We look at 
there's a lot of phrases that we use now that we never the word like 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 yeah. i say like way too often but we get it we know what it means you know it it is a way of saying an abstraction you know, it's to say, because I don't say, and I said this, I go, no, I don't know that I said this specifically. I think I said something to the effect of this. So I was like, what are you doing? And and people, it annoys people, like people particularly pay a lot of attention to language. If you say, well, I was like this, I was like that. I think. And then I, I can't even describe it without using like, because to me, I get it. I get, it's like, oh, I mean, abstractly, this is what was said, or this is what my experience was. Right, right. There's, and, there's context, there's, there's baggage there's good baggage with language mm -hmm. it's like it's like dale we, like like dale like it's a it's a it's a it's just it's a thought it's it's a it's an it's an act it's a mood it's an energy it's not go it's not hurrah it's dale yeah there's there is a there is a thing to think about is like, did we lose the thing? Did we lose it? Like if people say, oh, well, people use this thing. Oh, it sucks. It's like slang. Slang can be very, very helpful. Slang is where our words evolve out of slang and they just become words that we start to use over and over again until they sort of, because they fit. Generally, they fit they either, either they fit a space where there was a gap or they condense something. Mm -hmm. I can just say it in a more simpler term. And now you understand what I'm saying. This, because this term now becomes that, or man, I didn't have a word for this before. So, yeah. you know, what 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 is what is the English word for Schadenfreude? It's Schadenfreude. We don't we yeah we Schadenfreude. Like okay, it. yeah. it's a complex, weird German word, but we get it, and we haven't come up with our own word for it, so we'll just use that. Yeah. Um, and then things like y'all, like y'all's just gonna be a a, a a language contraction at some point. It will just be mm -hmm. natural across the country. It won't be. Uh, the thing that Southerners say, like everybody will just say y'all, it will not be a big deal. Um, I don't know. I, for whatever reason, I remember as a kid, y'all was like, you, if you said y'all in the wrong place, you might, you might draw some attention, but now I feel weird not saying, y'all. I feel weird saying you all. Uh, I did a magic show in, uh, I think it was Georgia years ago. And my uncle was there. And after the show, my uncle came up to me and says, I got a window for you. I said, yeah. So once I said, uh, you said you guys, you got to say you all. So you don't, don't say you guys here. Say you all because it's the South. And you guys, all of a sudden, they know you're a Yankee. Yeah. You I said, whatever, redneck hick. I'm going to say whatever I want. <laughs> um, ding, 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 ding. Meanwhile, I'm born in Alabama. But uh, that was it. And now it's totally thinking. flipped. So, now it's completely flipped. So, um, or is not, it, it, I would, it, I, I would say like, yeah, I can see in the workspace, it's, it's complicated. Like I use folks a lot. I use folks oh, a lot. Yeah. Folks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can see that. Cause you know, I, I, I am you're not exactly <laughs> the spitting image of a corporate, uh, jobs, jobs. Yeah. I, see, I know where you were. The way, the way, yeah. So if, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, for picks, I check people. They want to check out check out mini, uh, called minilanguage.medium.com. So go look up mini language. I don't think the word choice, I don't think it's really hard to look it up because they chose the word mini. When you type in mini language, you'll get all these other things. They have a thing called mini core, which is a 120 word subset of mini designed to be a complete language itself. Whoa. Which I think it's kind of a really cool idea. A mini mini. So kind of like a token. Yeah. Whoa. Uh, that's cool. They just got patch notes for the language. Yo, new subset dropped. Check it yeah, out. Yeah, he's he literally did a they literally like put this on GitHub. Wow. That's okay. I mean, that's the way you would do it nowadays, right? You couldn't you can't just be the guy uh uh coding you you, you got to you got to be on GitHub. You got to be on YouTube. You got to make it you got to make it happen on TikTok. Core mini core on TikTok. Yeah. So yeah. We'll see if this takes off. Um, nice. Um, I think it, it it could be useful. It could be. I yeah. I mean, I, I, listeners, please uh, let us know if you do or would use a mini uh, a mini language. 
uh, uh, to, to, to communicate. I think that would be interesting, having him in, in, an intermediary. Um, you know, we're definitely past the time of a Rosetta Stone. We kind of need, you, you can't just, yeah, I, okay, yeah. Um, I've got a pick. Uh, you've heard me talk about it so much, and so I'll keep it short, but um, uh, guess who still really likes the Things app? His name is Bryce. <laughs> <laughs> um, I... Uh, I don't know. I have this like weird, like undulation with things where like right now I'm like in this very like type a mode with it of using it a lot and wanting to be in it all the time. And then sometimes that kind of fades into the background a little bit. Um, but I'm, I'm back in it. I'm, I'm, I'm making projects. I'm organizing. I'm putting, they got they uh, actually the really interesting thing about things, uh, that is a kind of a newer thing for me and the way I use it is using it more like people use like notion. Like I, uh, so things is a, is a, is a to do app on, on the iPhone and the Mac and all. Um, but I have been using it, especially the past couple of days, just to, um, uh, just to write notes, to plan things out that are not exactly to do's, you know, they have, um, they, they've added a markdown support, uh, in it so you can just like have a whole a whole major big text document um, and then all of your to do's um, that's been really interesting and I have really liked um, uh, using that using that as a place for all for, for for ideas and plans to live because I had been I had been using drafts you know drafts um, the app mm -hmm. um, I I for a moment there, I was using that a lot. And I was like, okay, maybe this can be like, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll write stuff in drafts and I'll keep stuff in drafts and I'll use the inbox and the archive system and all that. But I'm not in drafts all the time. I'm in things all the time. And so to some degree, I've like had that unlock of like, just do it in things then. If you're getting it done, just do it in things. It's not a big deal. It's all marked down anyway. Um, so uh, uh, if, if you've got an iOS device or the Mac, uh, the Mac app of it is good too. Um, I continue to very highly recommend things, um, even despite the shock you will see when you see how much it costs. I think, I think that's a key thing where if it really works, then it's worth it. And it, the trouble is figuring out if it works or not. I, I always have this... How much do I want to get invested in the system and then find out that it doesn't do the thing I wanted to do or I've got a lot of stuff in there? But yeah. I mean, what, they, what do they charge per year? Or It's not per year. It's per platform. So it's 10 bucks okay. if you want the iPhone and the watch app. It's $20 for the iPad app, and it's $50 for the Mac app. But it is not subscription. It does have cloud syncing. All of the platform versions work with each other. Um, uh I, I think it's I, I think it's really really solid and 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 I've gone through all those three phases like I I have the iPhone app then I got the iPad app because the iPhone app wasn't enough on that and then I got the Mac app because I was on the Mac enough that I wanted that and um, uh, and I think it's uh, for a to do app that is very simple it is very in, in, uh, intuitively designed um, and it doesn't get in your way. For a, for a yeah, I think the pricing is very fair. I think they're 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 not. I get man. Part of me wants to just quit my job and like rage make apps for the app store that are free, to replace all the stupid things that are subscription based that have no business being subscription based. Yeah, and because it is it is like oh I just need to do this thing like oh well here's this thing it's subscription like I just need to do it once can I just buy it no. Right. Like it be, it, it's like the, the free with ads model. Like, yeah, I mean, the users would be more happy just paying once for the thing and owning it, but they're more valuable if they're subscribing, if they're watching ads, if they're, if they're two revenue streams instead of one, or if they're a revenue stream at all, you know, I've paid, uh, what, what, what does this math look like? $80. I've paid the things people $80 for their app, which is probably more than I've spent on any subscription app. I guess Adobe stuff, I pay my mm -hmm. $50 a month tax, but, um, 
but other than that, I don't maybe Ableton, but again, that's also a major music software suite. Um, this got me to pay eighty dollars for software, and I'm other than a video game, I probably haven't ever done that. Yeah, on on my phone. I look at, I've I've toyed with uh, Obsidian, the idea of going into that. I know a lot of people swear by it, and I'm sure they they know a lot that I don't. Um, and I like it because it's like, yeah, download it for your own system, it's free. You know, like, well, that's that's compelling, and it it seems like they are very very much committed to building a very good system yeah yeah and i think a lot of people swear by it and and i think you know hopefully we see more things like this more Mm -hmm. competitors in even just office productivity you know something that can upend google and microsoft 365 like i talked uh, over probably two years ago now because i think i just i just got my re my renewal for the hey.com email and i'm loving it Mm -hmm. like whatever about Basecamp people but like uh, I pay an okay price for it. It works really well. I see new features come up, and and I and I don't have to deal with ads. And you know what? Uh, I'm fine paying. I'm I will pay for a good service if it's a good service. <laughs> if it provides me something. Yeah, hey, hey is an interesting thing to me, but it's a hard thing. It's like and I'm cheap. It's like ah, oh, it's hundred bucks. It's like okay. I don't like it. Like, well, you can try it for 14 days, but I mean, I got to give everybody my, that new email address for that period. And that's the thing where I'm like, man, like that's a, it's a, it's not saying they're doing it the wrong way. It's just not an easy way for me to convince me to try a new thing when yeah. I won't know what it's going to like be like until I commit to that. It is. Yeah. It is a big commitment. And I think, and I don't know how you get around that, or maybe you can't, maybe, maybe that's, that's the play with, expensive software with, with software that costs. Yeah, if it's working for them, I guess, yeah, if it's a thing that's working for them, that's fine. I don't, and I'm not saying they're wrong. Some things like, oh yeah, this is wrong. But like, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't have an answer to that. I just know that like that, that's a big kind of, meh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, listeners, check the show notes for, uh, uh, how to send in your message. If you want us to cover an after things topic, or if you want to get your, get your voice in on any of the things that we talked about today. It's been after. Ooh. Hey, good show. That was fun. Yeah. Who needs those yeah. guys? Who needs those guys? What guys? Th- thank you. Then I'm I'm sa- I'm saying this more and more. What guys? There's that clip. There's a clip of a lady freaking out on an airplane from a few weeks ago that is kind of viral at the moment. Yeah, um, I I saw the headline. I didn't watch it because like I was on a flight once with a woman that had kind of a freak out like that, and she was clearly somebody who was dealing with mental health issues. And I remember when they escorted her off the plane, people applauded, and I just felt like this wasn't like some big dude who got drunk and was an asshole. Maybe she had substance, but this was clearly a person having some kind of episode, and I just felt bad. I felt bad for her. I felt like I did didn't need to be like ah yeah um you know yeah um well in any case we are real we were here this has been us um we think so we think so maybe it's a simulation but then you're also the simulation so nanner nanner okay now say goodbye to the people andrew Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll talk to you next time. Bye.